Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Tolkien Lecture on Fantasy Literature. My name is Alex, and I'm a third year undergraduate studying at Pembroke College, Oxford. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, the fantasy author Guy Gabriel Kay, who is joining us all the way from Toronto. Guy has published 14 novels and a poetry collection. He has quite an impressive awards cabinet, including the Aurora Award and the World Fantasy Award. Additionally, in 2014, he was invested with the Order of Canada, the, the country's highest civilian honor. Whether you are joining us on Zoom or on YouTube, we are delighted that you are with us. Before we begin, a little touch of housekeeping. Please feel free to use the Q&A box on Zoom or the YouTube chat on YouTube to submit your questions as we go along, and we will do our best to get through as many as possible at the end. Thank you for joining us, Guy. It's great that we have you with us. We are really excited to hear what you have to say, so please take it away. Thank you very much, Alex, for that introduction. And thank you all for being here in whatever mode, guise, or garb, with or without a Zoom background selected, we are not judgmental these days. First of all, of course, I want to express my appreciation to Pembroke College and the coordinators and sponsors of the Tolkien Lectures for inviting me to be numbered among the distinguished people, some of them friends who have done this over the past eight years. It was a lovely idea from the start and framed with enough latitude to allow variations on a theme, which will be, in fact, part of my subject today, variations on a theme. Call that foreshadowing, if you like, or just a signpost at the edge of the wood. We are, obviously, not gathered in Oxford in these fragmented times. Arguably, all times are fragmented, but not in the same way. This way, our way right now, involves being at home and using technology to assemble. It changes things. Were we in Pembroke College, for example, and I'd wanted to arrive early or stay a few days after, make my way back to the villages of East and West Hanny where I lived while we were working on the Silmarillion and the large barn behind Lidbrook Farmhouse. Back then, one took the 23 bus from Oxford to get out that way. I have no idea if that's still true. Yes, I could look it up, but sometimes I find it is better not to. The current existence or not of a bus route and number matters far less than the memory of one. Sometimes, and this will be a theme too, Overly explicit details not only don't matter, they undermine in life, in memory, in art. On benign afternoons back then, I used to take walks on breaks in my work. Lightford Grange lies close to Hanny. Cutting across fields would take me there. There were bulls. I am a Canadian, I have seen moose. I was careful, but not afraid. This might, in retrospect, have been a prime example of the foolishness of youth. I may be lucky to still be among the ungored living, able to speak with you. I'm pretty sure there was a fence, but pretty sure can get you in trouble. I also felt protected. Why? Well, Early in my stay in the village, I ruefully confess, I obtained a walking stick in the curious Canadian belief that everyone used those in the English countryside, damn it. I had read too much and experienced too little, one might say. I will pause here to allow you to laugh, chuckle, chortle, or otherwise express amused disdain for the young Canadian. Thank you, that's quite enough. In fact, the pub keeper, Mr. Stan Timms, loudly nicknamed me the squire from behind his bar in the plow the first time I proudly walked in with my stout stick. And to modify C.S. Lewis slightly, I almost deserved it. The name lasted a month or two. In my defense, you need to know that there was a stand with three or four sticks in it right beside the door. I had not, 
at that early stage of my visit to the plow, been told that they'd been there untouched for a decade. Extremely unfair. I still have that walking stick, by the way. It actually began a collection of them assembled through years of travels. One even has a hidden dagger revealed when you remove the handle. I have not had occasion to deploy it. It remains in a stick just to my left as we speak. Another there called a doctor stick was obtained in New Orleans. It had an old fashioned needle hidden within and a vial for one dares assume morphine. Walking sticks can be interesting. Life at Grange, by the way, had a legitimate place in Tudor history. It was there that the priest, Edmund Campion, was found hiding in the manor house by agents of Elizabeth I and carried off to London to be executed. It is almost impossible to convey what a powerful sense of entering into living within an entirely different world, indeed almost, I will say it, a fantasy world with a promiscuous access to the past that all of this induced in a young urban Canadian spending a year in the history-infused Oxfordshire countryside. It played a role in shaping me in a year seemingly calibrated to do that. I could tell stories for the whole of this lecture, but that's almost too easy for a novelist. And some of you will know I don't talk much about the editing of the Silmarillion in any case. There are layers of respect embedded in that. So I'd like to take us in a different direction. But because it isn't entirely different, I prefer segues to jump cuts. I'm going to lead with two quotations I love that might serve to usher us across the threshold, as it were. And the first is from J.R.R. Tolkien. I told you, we're doing a segue, not a wild leap. Although given the online nature of this encounter, you could be doing wild leaps in your homes and I'd never know. This is an observation, not a suggestion. I think you know that. So, segueing away. In on fairy stories, Tolkien wrote, and I quote, in Dasent's words, I would say, we must be satisfied with the soup that is set before us and not desire to see the bones of the ox out of which it has been boiled. What did he mean? What can his possibly narrow intent be expanded fairly to mean today. Well, let's wait a beat for the second companion quotation I want to use as a gateway here. It is from Walter Badgett, who wrote memorably, we must not let in daylight upon magic. I'll suggest that anyone interested in fantasy literature, the fantastic or fantastica as John Clute frames it, needs to contend with the reverberations of Badgett's line. Among other things, I think it usefully serves as a possible demarcation, a two solitudes notion for radically different ideas, attitudes among writers, scholars, readers, towards the handling and the nuances of magic. One can frame this as the work it all out and explain it to readers approach and the don't let daylight in or it ceases to feel like magic school. But I also mean this discussion, I hope it is obvious it will become so, to apply to craft and method in all literature not just to be about magic systems in a fantasy book or set of books. I don't want to frame this narrowly. It's less interesting, I think. How comfortable in our responses to art are we with mystery, with not knowing, with, for example, a presence of the numinous that we do not fully grasp? I suppose I could ask, how comfortable with this are we in life? 
but that takes us perhaps too wide for a single lecture. Because we also need to remember always that fiction is not life, that expectations and preferences for clarity in a story can legitimately be different from those of a life as it unfolds. And that different attitudes to ambiguity in art are entirely reasonable. But what about Tolkien's remark in this context? It joins for me with Badgett's, to put it simply. What J.R.R.T. said, quoting Dasent, was not and will never be an entirely easy observation for some scholars to process or agree with, or for some of his devotees, or for certain readers who do want the bones of the ox. They want the author to set that before them too. There's room to disagree with Tolkien, even if you love his work and his thinking in other ways. Because for some, the soup, the book or story we are given is, to extend the metaphor perilously, just the appetizer. There is, if you'll forgive me, a deep pleasure for some in digging in, unearthing the bones. I find it very hard, by the way, to give a lecture without a pun, but I may now have this out of my system for today. I don't think you can relax entirely, but extreme fear might be an overreaction. More seriously, I will say that an uneasiness about this with respect to Tolkien's own papers goes back for me a long way. I'm not doctrinaire about this. I might once have been more so, but you'll have noticed I'm a little bit older now. I can see arguments not only both ways, but many different ways. My purpose as to this is only to draw some glancing attention to a challenge, an issue, that to note it arises from Tolkien's own formulation. But on the central thesis embodied in the two quotes, What's my take? I'm going to suggest that the magic in a story, any story, and I'll stress again, this isn't just about the fantastic, exists on the page and also in what the author chooses not to put on the page. It reposes in spaces and silences that offer room for us in a work a chance to wonder, to invest that work with our own imagination because certain authors don't take that away from us. I've typed that last bit in italics, you should know. I hope you could hear them. There is a kind of art I call airless, works that don't allow us that room to breathe because the author a filmmaker perhaps, has so kindly done it all for us, has made clear exactly what we are to think and feel. And no, I'm not naming names. This isn't that kind of lecture, and it doesn't matter because everyone will have their own candidates if they accept the idea I'm proposing. I believe what is not said or shown can be as important as what we're given we get a chance to fill that space. So I'll leave a space for it here too. Let me shift ground very slightly to illustrate this idea of leaving air in a book, trying not to let in too much daylight, to refrain from, as it were, overexposing a scene or motif. I use an example from one of my own books because I was invited to discuss my work in personal history. I don't tend to do that, but an anecdote or two does feel right today, and there's a funny aspect to this story. I hope so, anyhow. I like being funny, or as my two younger brothers put it, I like to labor under the illusion I am. There is a somewhat erotic scene in my fourth novel, Tigana. I'm using somewhat here to properly respect a range of possible reader responses, you will understand. At one point in a late night bedroom encounter, 
the woman involved, much the more experienced and assured figure, reaches under her bed and retrieves an object. The eyes of the younger man with her widen, seeing it. The scene and the encounter continue. The object is not identified. Now, at the time Tigana was written, I had two wonderful agents, women immensely experienced in the business, readers of myriad manuscripts in all genres over decades, one in the UK, one in North America. They would grow over the years to also be two of my most loved people. Each of them got back to me quickly within a day of each other having finished reading a very long manuscript. That timing was fortuitous. There was no communication between them. They were each splendidly enthused about the novel with the sort of sharp, close reader responses a young writer cherishes and hungers for. I did cherish it. I still do, in fact. Older writers hunger for good readers too, perhaps even more in some ways. Towards the end of each telephone call, one from Toronto, one from London. There came a pause, an overture to a segue. And then, quite separately, each of my agents said, I do have a question though. Um, Guy, what was under Alienor's bed? Aside from laughing aloud and then learning a lesson from the sheer number of readers in the intervening 30 years who've had the same query, my answer then, and to those subsequent readers, and my point for our purposes here today is simple, perhaps even obvious. I didn't write what was under the bed in order to leave readers room to imagine, to breathe to guess and revise their guess, or also to just move on without worrying about it at all because not everyone cares. Incidentally, I deployed this same concept at the very end of Tigana. And yes, an even greater number of urgent queries have come my way over the decades about that. Endings of books carry a very particular weight, perhaps even more than something under the bed. So why am I sharing this in the current context, aside from still finding those two phone calls funny and thinking you might? Well, what, if not letting daylight in on magic, would it have been for me to spell that out? Surely, one form of magic in writing, or at least an aspiration to magic for authors, is the idea of leaving ambiguity sometimes. And surely also there remains as readers, the notion I have paired with it here of being satisfied with the soup before us, not asking the author or ransacking their papers to find the bones of an ox, even dare I say it, trusting they had a reason for writing a scene a particular way. This is a lecture, not a novel, different templates, a different dynamic, but I still like the idea of thinking through a subject together here, at least offering the illusion of that and leaving room for all of you and your thoughts on this. What I'm tacking us towards are two ideas joined by the quotations with which I began. They were together when we set out today, they're still with us. Those ideas about daylight on magic and about being satisfied with what is on the page. The first notion can be specific, as we've noted, to the use of actual magic in the fantasy genre. I don't want to glide past that, not in this particular lecture series, and so, to segue again to another part of our discussion, I want to bring in another quote. About 10 years ago, a biography of Gabriel Garcia Marquez appeared by Gerald Martin. Early in the book, 
Martin offered something he rightly saw as necessary, a working definition of magic realism, a genre, a literary form of which Garcia Marquez is generally acknowledged as the principal progenitor. Magic realism is defined in that biography as a mode of using magic and the supernatural in which, quote, the world is as the characters believe it to be without any indication from the author that this worldview is quaint, folkloric, or superstitious. If I tell you I read this, it smote my brow. I am offering only a soup song of hyperbole. If I didn't exclaim aloud then, I have done so many times since. Egad, said I, or something very like. I have been writing magic realism for decades without knowing it. It was a sensation not dissimilar, perhaps, to Moliere's Monsieur Chardin, who was startled and delighted to learn that he had been speaking prose all his life. I have also said, and you may chastise me this time if so minded, but I don't think you will, that the label magic realism is what a certain kind of reader attaches to a work of fantasy when they really like it, but don't want to admit an affinity to, a, well, to a mere fantasy novel. But we won't let ourselves go down that rabbit hole today, tempting as it might be. I prefer to frame this a bit differently for our purposes as to magic. It is true, leaving genre pigeonholes to one side where I tend to prefer to leave them, that from the 1990s, my own writing has been engaged by this idea of using magic only as needed and as useful for a story and, importantly for me, more and more as the years passed, as a way of diminishing the smugness we so often bring to the beliefs and behaviors of the past. Can you believe it? Someone might say. The Byzantines thought that if you had someone carve a curse tablet for you, a curse tablet, and you dropped it into an open grave secretly before it was closed up, the curse would be effectuated. How, to use the word Gerald Martin used, how very quaint. Or, listen, in Tong Dynasty China, People believed that if a body lay unburied without proper rights, the tormented ghost of the deceased would linger at that spot until buried and rites took place. Well, my desire for years has been to write books wherein the beliefs, the world understanding of the times that inspire my work, are given value in the novels, where the setting I evoke for readers offers these beliefs as true. They are rendered by this not quaint or folkloric, not naive, superstitious, amusing. We cannot distance ourselves as readers if I do it right from these characters behind the barrier of today's so very superior understanding of the world. The ghosts of the unburied dead are actually there in my novel, Under Heaven. Readers inhabit for a time a world where this is so with consequences. This for me, is such a potent possible use of magic in fiction. It can carry us part of the way back to the way people once saw the world. 
And, and here we come again to observations I made at the very start today. This demands that daylight not be let in on magic. In writing this way, with this aspiration, we are not constructing a magic system with its rules. We are creating, or we are reading about, characters who believe the world to be a certain way. And it is. It is that way. If the world was mysterious and often frightening to them, it should, to my mind, be made so, left so, for a reader. The mystery, the not knowing is at the heart of what I want. It is apparently labeled magic realism. It is that we've just seen offered at the very definition of that form. But I'll argue it is an approach equally well seen, not as a defined genre, but as a tool in any writer's toolbox. For me, it has functioned that way for some time. There are, of course, different approaches. There's a case to be made that there are two dominant strains of using magic in the literature of the fantastic. I think myself, there are many strains. I think the binary is overused, but for the moment, let's examine two and expand as needed. One approach is the one I've just set out. The other may be said to be built around the construction of systems and mechanics for the magic wielders in a novel. This is seen as a core element of the world building which has come to lie at the heart of this sort of book, a key element in the attraction. The geography, the flora and fauna, remote and recent history, sexual politics, economic underpinnings of society, all are blocked out. And there are readers who will criticize a writer for failing to properly set forth these elements, these bones of the ox. The pleasure, the reward of such a book lies in part, I'll suggest, in how precisely and vividly these and other factors are delineated. It is a bonus, possibly, if the author is skilled enough to avoid doing so by way of clumsy information dumps. There is the example of Tolkien, however, where many underlying elements emerged quietly in the book, beautifully integrated, but much else resides in the appendices to The Lord of the Rings. For a certain kind of lover of his trilogy, an enduring joy of it lies in this building up of background. Languages too, in his case, done over decades, as far back as 1917, when he was recovering from trench fever occurred in the Great War, when he sketched out the first idea of the story of Baron and Luthien. Those of you familiar with Oxford might know that on his grave, and that of his wife, Edith. The names Baron and Luthien are also inscribed. For some readers of the trilogy, and I was one of those, the richness of the work resided in entirely different elements, but that's not what I want to address today. We'd be here all day, really, and present circumstances prevent us from repairing to a pub after to talk about it. But for certain readers, much of their delight in fantasy fiction reposes in the daylight let in on magic. That's what I mean by the second strand here. The clarity of the author's rules, the detailing, accumulated layers of precision and cleverness, these bring a particular kind of pleasure, a different kind. I've been speaking about handling magic and fantasy here now, not the magic of literary achievement, except that again, I'm going to add something and correct myself because it is 
a literary achievement, a surely legitimate form of it, if a book or a series brings delight in this way to a great many readers. My point is to suggest that perhaps, as to fantasy, that it might be wrong. Or maybe that it's only correct for some books and some readers. I'm Canadian. We lived with KBLs, even more than with apologies, perhaps. Sorry, sorry, that's a digression. But specificity, details, careful working out, these are at the heart of the reward of fantasy for some. For others, well, for them, that very same clarity, that bright revealing light can be an undermining of pleasures. Different pleasures, the ones they seek. Badgett's their guy. They covet mist, fog, ambiguity, the not spelled out, the elided, the moments that characters and readers don't understand. Room lapped for wonder. For me, I always feel that when I'm working with aspects of the numinous in a book, it is proper to be careful how much light comes in. We do not, as I wrote in a novel many years ago, understand everything about the world. I've used literal mist and fog in night streets or deep woods for their inherent narrative value, obviously the tension and drama they afford, but also because sometimes not seeing clearly is the proper approach for me to addressing elements of magic to almost touching the numinous, to eliciting in a reader when I'm hoping to. None of us can ever wholly succeed in an assured eliciting of reader responses, both because we have our limitations as artists and because readers are as different as, well, readers are as different as people are. This truth feels to be embedded in the nature of art at the heart of something I always say. A book is a dialogue, not a monologue by the writer. Let me try to bring us in now towards the harbor or out of the forest where we've been walking a path together. Either metaphor works for me. Let's go to another book reference again to one of mine for simplicity. In Sailing to Serantium, the first of a pair of novels inspired by the time of Justinian and Theodora in Byzantium, I've set a scene on an isolated country road. There is fog, a mist so heavy as to make the very road impossible to see. It is a day of sacrifice known as such for a long time in this remote part of the world. My protagonists are being followed from the inn where they spent the night and not by people who mean them well. They leave the road to hide. They enter the margins of the wood beside. Sounds are heavily muffled, but they think they hear something shouldering through the trees, something ahead of them, not the pursuit from behind. Then they catch a shrouded, half glimpse they see or think they see and only for an instant the huge primal impossible creature making those sounds on this day of power then the mist closes in again when they go back to the road the leader of those pursuing them is lying dead there torn apart And the lives of my protagonists 
especially the inner life of the artist, the mosaicist leading that party? Well, they changed from that moment in ways they cannot ever explain or that he can ever entirely express in his art, even when he tries. They've had a glimpse of the numinous. And as Rilke wrote in the Duino Elegies, every angel's terrifying. There is no clear vision in that wood during that pursuit. And a change occurs within them. Their lives are somehow saved. They don't understand. The scene is anchored in, driven by the idea that there was no daylight on that magic. That's what I hoped to do with it at any rate. That's why I wrote it that way. Success or failure, as I said earlier, this is always a dialogue. Each reader decides how they feel. So, in truth, to every listener to a lecture. And perhaps this is the best way I can end these remarks, along with a sincere thank you for your patience. Because that is what many of us making art want to do to those engaging with our work. We want to effect a change in you, leave you not entirely certain how it happened, but believing in the days, months, years after that it has. That, friends, is the soup some of us try to set before you in the hope it is found rewarding. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Guy, for that wonderful lecture. Um, now we have about uh, 20 minutes for questions. And we'll begin with a few that were sent in in advance. Uh, and then we'll look at questions sent in through Zoom. Uh, so people on the Zoom, uh, please use the Q&A box. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, for the first question, uh, this comes from Casimir. He says, or she says, has your undergraduate background in philosophy in any way impacted you as a writer? Okay, uh, I do not want to introduce, to introduce anyone into the belief that I have any sort of levels of expertise in philosophy. I have an undergraduate interest in it, not an immersion in the discipline. What I think may connect things up, it's an interesting question, is the fact that my earliest, strongest interest in philosophy was in moral philosophy and ethics. Uh, I think that my work is an expression of that same interest, not necessarily born of the studies in philosophy, but arising from the same interest that led me to want to study philosophy. Uh, a number of years ago, probably about 20 or 25, you know, I delivered a similar lecture on uh, the ethics of fiction at the University of Toronto, uh, arguing that there was such a thing as an ethics of fiction. And that arose from that same early interest in such themes of reflection. It might be fair, Casimir, to say that my subsequent training in the law has a couple of closer links to what ended up being my writing career in a couple of specific ways. Uh, first of all, uh, no litigation lawyer in criminal law was what I was interested in doing. It ever just working on one file at a time. You are a juggler, you're constantly forced to keep several balls in the air in your, in your daily routine. And from the start, as some of you who will know my Fianna Tapestry, 
I rashly, rashly, recklessly launched myself into uh, a work that had a ridiculous number of balls in the air at one time. And it might have been, it might have been that training, that inculcation of the idea that you're supposed to be able to do that, that influenced my writing. And the other thing about legal training that uh, I'm grateful for is that a courtroom lawyer, a litigator, a criminal lawyer, needs to be able to become an instant expert in an astonishing variety of things. Not a real expert, expert enough to cross-examine a witness for the other side who is expert in that area. You need to become knowledgeable about tire skid marks on a rainy day on a certain kind of highway to challenge someone's thesis about how fast your client was driving. And for the kind of fiction I've come to write, I needed to become knowledgeable about chariot racing in the sixth century or medicine in the ninth or 10th in Iberia that I'm obviously in no possible way a genuinely knowledgeable person, but I became knowledgeable enough to talk to those who really were, to read their books, write them, speak to them, in some cases become friends with them and tap into their expertise because I knew the questions to ask. And so in those ways, both the philosophy background and the law background have probably penetrated. There are probably also other ways that they're there. We don't always know. That's been part of my theme today. We don't always know exactly what's working on us. Thank you. That's so fascinating. I always think, you know, writers have to wear so many hats and that just, that all makes so much sense. Um, our second question comes from Stephanie uh, in North Carolina, and she says, your books tie together fantasy and history so beautifully. I know you, like many other fantasy authors, are a fan of Dorothy Dunnett and other historical fiction writers. Why do you think a love of our past world lends itself so well to the creation of new worlds? Well, this could be a lecture, you know. You're at risk here. Um, First of all, I think that there is an obvious connectivity between an interest in myth, legend, folklore, and in fantasy, in the writing of fantasy literature. And by definition, this is going to involve an interest and engagement with the past, various times and places. So I think that that aspect of fantasy literature, the part that ties to myth and legend, supernatural elements of people's beliefs is, is a natural fit. I think that what is not as often discussed, Stephanie and others, is something that's really intensely important to me, which is the extraordinary way that writing with what someone once called about my books, a quarter turn to the fantastic, becomes yet another tool in the writer's toolbox for exploring the past. That quarter turn to the fantastic does so many things for us. Uh, one of them is that it can detach the themes of a story from a narrowly specific time and place. It can make them about any or many times and places. Uh, I've been asked almost every time I'm in certain parts of the world touring for the books. One of the questions that will be raised is somebody in the audience will stand up and say, when you wrote Tigana, were you writing about us? And 
it's a question that touches me deeply for obvious reasons, but it also motivates and inspires me because it tells me that the use of the fantastic to explore history has had that desired effect, that it has widened the themes of a story. Tugan is very much about identity and culture and the way in which occupying powers seek to erase and erode the self-identity of a conquered people to make them easier to absorb. That could be told as a story, it has been told, in many very specific contexts. Korea under the Japanese, Wales, Ireland, it's, it's very specific to certain locations and times. But it's also, for me at any rate, emblematic. It's paradigmatic of what occupying powers so often seek to do to ease their way in what they want to achieve. And that is another aspect of how fantasy serves to sharpen how we can think about history. Yeah, that's great. I agree <laughs> with that. Um, our third question comes from someone identified only as H. Uh, and the question is, Isabel takes place in and around a host of beautiful and particularly religious locations such as Entremont and the Saint Sauveur Cathedral. Uh, first part of the question is, why do you think fantasy literature is so intimately connected to the concept of space? Um, and there's a second part. Do you want me to say that sure. with the question? Okay, second part is, uh, is fantasy a way of telling stories about people or places? There's another lecture. Have you even got an hour? Um, first of all, I'm going to suggest that it's not so much that fantasy literature lends itself to writing about places. I think that theme, motif, desire is internal to some writers. I think someone like Alan Garner, for example, is absolutely intimately associated with Cheshire and writing about certain parts of the world. And his characters either are outgrowths of that or when they go there are confronted with the impact or power of place. So my own surmise is that it's not so much inherent in a genre as it is inherent in certain writers. Uh, Faulkner is a writer about place. Uh, William Kennedy, the American novelist, writes pretty much only about his hometown of Albany in upstate New York. Alice Munro, the Nobel Prize winner, writes about small town Canada. Uh, the writing about place, I think, emerges from the author's own inclinations, predispositions, fascinations, obsessions even. I think that's, that's my take on it. As far as whether fantasy is about place or people, I think that's not so much a second question as a reformulation of the first one. I think that any literature can be about some fusion of the two of those. I think perhaps I'll go further and say that slack literature, less strong literature, may be books that have no sense in the reader, in this of no sense, that the characters are organically linked to where we find them. Or if you want to be more benign, and I'm in a good mood today, so I will be, you can say that that placelessness, that absence of specific place, can be seen by some writers as an attribute of the modern world. That characters can be deliberately made to be divorced from or lacking any strong sense of place. When I wrote Isabel, the book that, that was raised in the question for, uh, I have a character say of a millennial love triangle, Celtic and Roman, recycling 
through time in the south of France, I have someone say, we're the story for this place. So that idea of character and place has always interested me, but I think it's more about the author than about the genre. Yeah, great answer. Um... Uh, our fourth question comes from Susan and she says, not to take anything away from Tolkien, but uh, when will your next book be released? Well, nobody's new book takes anything away from books we've loved. Uh, but I got the context in the Tolkien lecture setting. Um, I am infamously reticent about works in progress. I, I love Joyce's secrecy, silence, and stealth as the way in which he produced his work. And uh, that's my own inclination too. What I can say, because I did talk about this a while back recently, is that the new novel has been delivered to all my publishers. Uh, and I am now in the process of working on the revisions with notes. Uh, which will not take that much longer at this stage. I think you can expect to see a new book sometime around this time next year without pinning me down to that because there's so many variables that come into it, especially during COVID. But I think that spring of 22 is a reasonable guess. Well, that's very exciting. We'll have something to look forward to. Um... So we have about 10 more minutes if we want to go to the Zoom Q&A. We've got a, got a bunch of good questions there. Um, These are fun. They, they are fun. <laughs> we, we really can stay here all afternoon. There's some wonderful questions showing up <laughs> Too bad here. we can't go to that pub. Go um, with the first one. Go with the first one. It's a good all question. All right. Uh, from Dana says, Given that you have left so much space, so much air in your novels for readers to fill in with their own imaginations, are there stories or characters from your books that you revisit in your own imagination or that you wish you could go back to and write more about? That's, that's a pretty terrific follow-on to what I've been talking about today. Um, I think the short answer is mostly not. I think my own formulation of this is to say that if I went back, I would be closing the loop, closing the space that I deliberate being left open. In a couple of the books, I have uh, been pretty explicit about this, that ending of Tigana I mentioned, uh, which suggests that we don't know what happens after the book ends. The story ends, but the lives do not. And I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated by the idea of an ongoing existence that I don't want to pin down too precisely. Uh, I think this is important for me, for my own creative method, to leave that, to leave that space, to use the word we've been using, rather than go back and, and close it down. Uh, so I don't tend to go back and think about what I would do if I carried forward. Uh, in Last Light of the Sun, I took a motif from the, from the sagas, from the Icelandic sagas, whereby very marginal characters in the novel, somebody who comes on to deliver a message, I spent a page or two detailing the rest of the life of that messenger who had absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the novel. They literally walk on, messenger number one, and hand something to someone. And what I was getting after with that was the idea, and I hope that readers would take it away, is that you could have written, I could have written, someone could write a full book about the lives of people who are only on the side of the story that a creator chose to tell. I wanted to give value to the idea that just because a life is not expounded upon in that book, it is still a life, a set of people, a set of stories 
that could have been told. And that's part of the leaving of space for me. Yeah, that's not a great answer. Um, what do you like? Oh, there's so many good ones. Uh, I do think uh, this, this now the first question, the, which was the second question, uh, looks interesting if that. Okay, sure. That's good for you. Um, about the mists and the dark woods. Okay, uh, go for it. Says that, uh, Kathy says that you use mists and dark woods as a metaphor for a writer not saying everything and leaving some things numinous. However, in the lions of Oliver Sun, in the penultimate scene, it is too much light that leads to lack of knowledge. Can this technique be used as well? And if so, can you give an example? Happy to know, Kathy, she's an evil, dreadful academic with far too much intelligence. And an on-the-spot giving of an example, here's what I'll say. It would, be, it would be a reflection of my own limitations if the only way I could explore this sort of ambiguity was by putting someone in a fog. That that's a metaphor that can be made literal in some instances, but that's all it is. In Lions of Alvesan, the scene she's talking about, there is a setting sun that backlights certain figures and those watching them, looking down upon them, cannot tell them apart. So yes, of course, you can use other literal methods to withhold information in that way. I had entirely different reasons in that book for working it that way. That wasn't about the numinous. I suspect Kathy knows this, she's being provocative. But uh, I think that the idea of withheld information has more than the one role to play. And the emotional impact of not knowing then knowing something was what I wanted to convey there. I think that the unreliable narrator to get back to, can you give examples? An unreliable narrator, and there's so many very good examples, are a classic way for a writer to appear to be offering information. And then as the book continues, the reader comes to realize but that's not what's going on at all. Gene Wolfe in fantasy literature, uh, Nabokov in uh, several of his books, uh, certainly in, in Pale Fire, best example I know of an unreliable narrator, is letting you think you know what's going on and then bit by bit, cutting the ground up from under your feet on that. So there are many ways that we can use ambiguity, withheld information, revealed information at a dramatic moment as, as uh, elements of what we're trying to do. Yeah, um, I, I think we may have time for one more question. We might go slightly over, but if that's all right with you. Um, there, would you, I'll give well, you- Somebody a asked about uh, this past year. Yeah, that was the one I was- no, I, <laughs> We know each other too well already. <laughs> On the same wavelength. So do you want to read it out for people? Yes, sorry, hold on, I have to scroll. Okay, wanted to make sure I had the right one. Um, how have the limitations, this is from Paula, how have the limitations and exegies of this past year affected the focus of your current writing? We all live and work in our time. And that can be in the broadest sense, the 20th century, 21st century, 17th century. We live in our time. We carry some of the views and attitudes of our time. Uh, we live in the specifics of our time. Are we living through a war? Are we living through uh, a pandemic. And there is no possible way that these things cannot filter into our lives. Uh, 
a friend of mine just lost his mother this week. Uh, I can't imagine anything he does in the immediate future will not be filtered through that reality one way or another. Uh, one of the ways I try to deal with the pandemic, with COVID the last 14, 15 months, was to constantly remind myself of how savagely harsh lives of many writers I deeply admire and respect. Uh, Anna Akhmatova, Mandelstam, uh, the Italian poet Montale. So many writers lived through five years of war, say, in the Second World War, were uh, imprisoned at risk of death in times that were for many, many years brutally harsh. And then I tell myself that this is and has been a very bad time and it has been far worse for many people I know for many different reasons, economic, cultural, small children at home. There are so many reasons why it's an exceptionally difficult time. But I have actually found motivation in reminding myself that writing is what I do by now, that uh, this is what I live to do. And keeping your head focused on the work and feeling fortunate that this is the nature of my work, that I can come down the hall to my study to do what I do has been uh, has been a gift of sorts in a horrible time. And so there's no doubt to me that when I look back at the book I just finished, there will be motifs, there will be lines, there will be phrases, and I'll say, you know, that is a, a COVID year formulation. But I think as much as anything else, it becomes a specific form of the larger point was that we live and work in the times we're given. And that's what I tried to do in this past year. Oh, wonderful. I'm sure this time uh, next year, we'll all be very happy that you were able to write through the pandemic as hopefully that's when the new book's coming out. Um, those are all great questions. Sorry to anyone whose questions we didn't get to get to. Um, but we do have to wrap it up now, so I will say, Thank you again, Guy, for sharing your time with us um, and inspiring us with your thoughts on fantasy. Uh, I also say thank you to the Pembroke College Fund and the uh, Caddis Family Foundation. Their support enables this lecture series to happen. Um, and lastly, thank you to everyone for attending, both in Zoom and on YouTube watching. Uh, we hope you'll join us again next year for the ninth annual Tolkien Lecture on Fantasy Literature. I would say hopefully it will be in person, but I'm not going to jinx it. <laughs> um, and until then, uh, stay safe, stay well, and stay inspired. Thank you. Thank you all.